All right, everybody, welcome back. Welcome back to the Orthodox Ethos and another uh, online course. Glad you are able to be with us. I hope you had a blessed Holy Week and Pascha and you're celebrating the Feast of Pascha continually through the 40 days. Here we are in Greece, uh, officially on the Feast of Mid-Pentecost here at 4 a.m. here in Greece. And uh, it's a it's a blessed day to begin this new course. As you can see here, we're going to be talking about the Russian uh, catacomb church, the new martyrs of Russia. And it's going to be a very, very interesting and I think very helpful course for all of us for many, many reasons. We'll go over that shortly. So we're coming to you from uh, Petrochatus of Greece, and we're live streaming right now through Facebook, three different channels on Facebook, on YouTube, and through our Crowdcast page, and all of those who are patrons who are also following us and able to access our question and answer every Thursday, which will be a very important part of this course. So all of you who are following us on social media but are not patrons or not signed up, I encourage you to do that so you can take part in the discussion, the question and answer that happens every Thursday at 9 p.m. And there you can submit your questions uh, through the Patreon uh, uh, portal. And then we get together through the Crowdcast uh, uh, portal over there, the, the Crowdcast page we have. Of the Orthodox Ethos, and we have about a two-hour discussion usually every Thursday, 9 p.m. Uh, this course will be going for the next two and almost exactly two months, two and a, and a week, uh, 10 weeks, and we're going to go through today uh, the whole outline, the whole uh, break it down, exactly what the course is going to cover and what we're going to be doing. So let's begin. Let's get going because we have a lot to say and, and usually. Uh, we always run late. So let's get going and look at our prayers. As usual, we're going to chant the Treparian for the Feast of Pentecost, which is going to be coming up shortly. So it's apropos, and then also the prayer before uh, the gospel. Uh, so join us in that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Illumine our hearts, O Master, who lovest mankind with the pure light of divine knowledge. Open the eyes of our mind to the understanding of the gospel teaching. Implant us also in us also the fear of thy blessed commandments. And trampling down all carnal desires, we may enter upon a spiritual manner of living, both thinking and doing such things as are well pleasing unto thee. For thou art the illumination of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God. Unto thee we ascribe glory, together with thy Father, who is from everlasting, and all holy good and life, great spirit, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Tu sali sana dixas, kata pemsas aftis to pnevma, to aigi on jedi afton, tiniku meni sagi nesas, filantrope doxa. See, I mean, all right. So, this is the 10 week course outline today. We're going to be going through the outline and the introduction to the course. Such an important topic, so timely and so important. And it has been, as you'll see, a topic which our fathers in the faith, our predecessors, who we must follow if we're going to be uh, true Orthodox Christians, truly struggling in the Orthodox faith, that to follow the fathers before us, not just the fathers in the ancient days or in the West or the East or from the fifth century, but those who came before us. And they have said to us, as you'll see, how important it is to know and to be familiar and to be inspired by and to be guided by the witness of the new martyrs, 
Uh, the new martyrs throughout the Orthodox Church. We're going to be looking at the Russian new martyrs, but the Russian the, the new martyrs in all of the Orthodox Church, including, of course, Romania and Serbia and other places that were under the atheist communist yoke. But also we have new martyrs in the uh, time of the Ottomans. Very important witness as well. Perhaps we'll make that a topic for discussion, a topic for a course in the future. A lot of people don't know much about the new martyrs under the Ottomans and the Turks. But all of the new martyrs in the 20th century are especially close to us and important for us to know. And this is why this course is going to be, I think, very helpful for all of us. It's going to reorient us uh, uh, and, and encourage us uh, immensely uh, to stay focused on Christ and his church. Uh, so this is going to be uh, a course which will be tough. It'll be tough to listen to sometimes. Uh, it'll be challenging. It'll be uh, disturbing because we're going to be looking at both the height of sanctity, which is giving one's life for Christ, laying down one's life for his for his brother, as the Lord says, is the greatest uh, expression of love. The Lord did it, of course, first and showed us the way. But we're also going to be seeing the height of evil, the, the degree to which the Soviet atheist uh, system took man from uh, his humanity into into subhumanity and and, and demonic uh, activity. So it's going to be a challenging course for all of us as we go forward. Um, something that was is on the first pages of our textbook, the Catacomb uh, Church, uh, Russia's Catacomb Saints, rather I should say, by um, uh, our authors, Father Seraphim Rose, Ivan uh, Andreev, and Father Herman. Uh, is a on the very front of the book is a, um, a dedication and we can see that here in the book and see if we can get that focus you see that this book is dedicated to the christian martyrs today in russia tomorrow in america that's a famous uh well-known prophecy from a elder in harbin in china uh, who said that what we're seeing today in Russia will not remain in Russia, but will come to America one day. And now I think we can say, after all these years, that what happened yesterday in Russia is coming and is already present today in America. So I've changed it slightly to update it to make it more appropriate. Yesterday in Russia, today in America and in the West, and that is the spirit of totalitarianism, of... Uh, atheist uh, totalitarianism, which is coming and which is very obvious, and the insanity that comes along with it, the loss of not only the spiritual life, but even the natural man becomes, uh, loses his way and, and, and turns towards subhumanity. So that, I think, is perhaps a appropriate update to that uh, dedication. So we're going to be going from today, May 25th, and all the way through July 27th, uh, this course. And we're going to look today at a 10-week overview of the course. The outline of the course, let's go back to our text. Uh, for those of you who have not been familiarized with the outline, and for those who will view it uh, perhaps later, this course will introduce and examine the witness and the stance of the new martyrs under the atheist yoke, as well as the life witness and stance of the church in Russia during the first two decades of the Bolshevik rule, 1917 probably should be more appropriate, to 1938 is what we're going to try to cover. A lot of material. Introductory course. Can't go as deep as we would like, but that's what I think needs to be given to all of us is a good introduction so we can all take our time uh, and get the material and read it and study it. In any case, we should be reading and studying the lives of the saints often, if not daily in our daily struggle, <clears throat> and including in those should be the lives of the new martyrs. My guess is, my guess is, and I think it's a pretty good guess because I have a little experience with contemporary English-speaking Orthodox, most of us are not familiar with most of the lives of the new martyrs. So this course hopefully will be very helpful for many of us. This course aims to present the ecclesiological and the spiritual stance and witness of the confessors and martyrs of the church under militant atheism 
for the purpose of learning valuable lessons for the faithful today who face the rise of authoritarianism and Kesaropapism in the post-COVID world, if we even can call it a post-COVID world yet, but we're getting there. Furthermore, more specifically, we're going to aim to better understand the conditions to which the Church of Russia was subjugated, subjected. And that's going to be a little bit today in the next course. Uh, we're going to be looking at um, the conditions, the historical conditions, uh, to get the right context, right? We're going to jump into some very intense spiritual uh, teachings and experience and examples, but it's very important to have the context, the, the historical context as well, and we'll be doing that hopefully um, in the next couple weeks well for you so you get oriented. To encounter and be edified as well by the witness and the confessors and the martyrs during this period. To glean... Spiritual insights from the stance of the new martyrs for application to our lives. To discern the errors of Kestrel-Papism or Sergianism in the context of the uh, church in the, uh, under the Soviets and understand the stance of the saints. So those are some of the, the aims of the course. Uh, we'll be inevitably getting to other matters as well. and. But that is the that is the the basic aim of the course. All right. As well, let's look at the dates and the topics, uh, and just make sure that everyone is well acquainted with when and and what dates and what topics we're going to be covering throughout the next ten weeks. So we're here. Today's May twenty fifth. Introduction: Russia's Golgotha type of the end times. We'll be looking at the mainly at the roots of the revolution. Why did the revolution happen, spiritually speaking? What were the predecessors? That's very important for us to understand. What? Why did we? Why did Russia come to the point where it had this terrible revolution? Very important. And we were looking at some of the historical dates and times and getting acquainted with uh, what was going on in Russia at the time and really throughout the whole Orthodox world. Uh, next lesson will be the onslaught. Of persecution, we'll get more deep, more deeply into the persecution and also the resistance of the holy fathers, the saints, the martyrs under under the uh, leadership of Saint Tikhon, the Patriarch of Moscow. On June eighth, we'll look at the Renovationists. This was a movement of uh, liberalizing, westernizing. I don't know. There's a variety of terms we could use to try to describe this movement within Russia. Uh, which took the opportunity of the new uh, Bolshevik rule to essentially create schism and havoc in the church and to introduce all kinds of uh, and untraditional, unorthodox ideas and practices in the life of the church. And we'll look at that. Very important for understanding the, um, the persecution uh, was not just uh, through taking of blood, shedding blood, but it was multifaceted. It was, uh, it was the, the demons were unleashed to bring in all kinds of insane and innovative ideas, which are undermining, which undermine the path to heaven. And the uh, the renovations were a tool in the, the demonic attack on the church uh, at a time when the church was already under tremendous pressure from the Soviet power. So it's very important to understand the revelations that, that unfortunately, that movement and that mentality, unfortunately, has not disappeared from the world. And it has not been sufficiently rebuked. And it continues on. So it's very important for us to understand what, what, what the renovationists were about, what their ideas and their mentality. And we'll look at, of course, the Orthodox response. On June 15th, the satanic Bolshevik mentality and methodology will look more deeply at how the uh, the demons and the uh, atheists attack the church uh, and the methodology. It's very important for us to understand in the science of the spiritual life, half of the battle, uh, so to speak, is to understand the enemy and to be able to defend ourselves and spot his uh, methodology. And so this will be a an opportunity for us to see that in, t in time and space in the history of the uh, the struggle against uh, 
militant atheism in Russia. On the 22nd of June, we'll look at the life and the witness of the new martyrs from 1918 to 1928, so we'll actually go into the lives, and we'll spend most of that whole session just looking at aspects of the lives of the saints and getting valuable lessons from them in their struggle and their witness and their suffering. And then on the lesson six, right in the mi middle of this course, we'll turn our attention and we'll have arrived, I think, sufficiently to uh, look at the 1927 uh, declaration of Metropolitan Sergius, who was the wasn't the locum tenens, but he was acting as the locum tenens, the the uh, placeholder, as it were, for the, until the patriarch was going to be elected, the one who was supposed to govern the church temporarily. Uh, but he was not actually the locum tenens; he was the deputy for the locum tenens. And but he, under pressure of the communists, issued a declaration and took a stance, which was decidedly different than that which had come before him. And his stance and his ideas and his outlook have been termed Sergianism. And they are, I think, a unique form of Kestro papism. And we'll be looking at that on the 29th. And then we'll look at the consequences more particularly and the de uh, of the declaration for the church and for the uh, society and then also the Orthodox response. And then we'll look at the, the, the catacomb church, which was the church that went underground uh, necessarily forced largely because of the declaration to go underground. And we'll look at that from what all the material that we have available to see what what life, who, who they were, what they thought, and what life they led, uh, the stance of the catacomb church from 1928 uh, to uh, the middle of the of the 30s, at least, we'll look. We won't go, unfortunately, into the 50s and 60s, which would be beyond the scope of our uh, uh, our lectures tonight. But very interesting and very instructive. And there's plenty of material that you can find on your own today. Uh, one of the links that I I want to share, if I can, I'll get that, and at least we'll get that online uh, in our various. Uh, social media outlets, is the entire collection of the Orthodox Word, Father Seraphim Rose, Father Herman's publication from uh, th those days, from the 60s and 70s and 80s. It has so much material on the new martyrs, especially during the 70s. And so that will be a, a link. I put it online, actually, I think. Uh, I'll put it online uh, before too long. And you can find those and go read those. Uh, much of our textbook, the Catacomb, uh, church is taken from those uh, those pages of the Orthodox Word in the 1970s. Then we'll go on the 20th and we'll look at the life and witness of the new martyrs from the uh, declaration in 27, in 28 through 1938, and the purge, the great purge of Stalin in 37, 38, in which many, many uh, tens of thousands of uh, new martyrs um, were made. And then finally, we'll wrap it up with our lessons for the last Christians. We'll kind of summarize the course and we'll try to apply what we've learned to the contemporary situation. So I hope you'll stay with us throughout this whole 10 weeks. And I hope that this will be a very valuable course for you. Uh, just so you have this, because some of you are new to our, our lectures you can have you can access the lectures through a number of ways a number of places online uh, through crowdcast and patreon and that's where you could also access the question and answer
All right, we back. So everybody can see me again. I don't know. I don't know what that was. That was all about. So forgive me for that. Hopefully, give me a shout out that you can see me again. And <laughs> all right. So I don't know. Can you all? Yes, he's back. All right, good. All right. So we were talking about access to the lectures, and. Uh, you know, there's the lectures are obviously all online for anyone. If anybody wants to support us, they can do that through Patreon, and you can ask, have access also to the question and answer. That's how we've set it up, and there's a variety of reasons why we've done that. I know people will say, "Why? Why is Father Peter talking about money?" I saw somebody say that, but the reality is that we have a large platform that we have to support, and it's a necessary um, evil, so to speak in order for us to be able to do this and to be able to come to you and give you these lectures and support this platform. By supporting us through Patreon, you're supporting not just these lectures, but our publishing work, our translation work, our online uh, work uh, through Orthodox Ethos and all the rest. I rarely, if ever, talk about this, but people always say I have to talk about this, so I do it. And there it is. That's about as, that's about as much as I'll talk about this for the next 10 weeks. If you want to support us, you know how to do that. If you don't, you just want to take care of, uh, watch, watch the lectures, that's fine too. I'm happy. I'm very happy that we have anyone here for any reason and wants to learn about the new martyrs. But here you have access through the uh, various uh, online uh, social media, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. All of those places are fine, are places you can find these lectures. You can watch them and follow along. And so plenty of uh, uh, opportunities. Uh, the text we're going to be using, and I highly highly encourage you to get and download and print out if you if you can is the russia's catacomb saints by ivan andrea father zero from rose and abbot herman it's online in a variety of places as you see here online uh on, on the screen uh there's the russian catacomb saints blog spot there's a scri scribed uh, uh, version there's an online version through another uh, site in australia and two more that you can see there. So if you have any problem getting the first or second, there's two or three more. And I highly encourage you to get it and you know spend the spend the money, spend the time to print it out and have it as a book, bind it in some way or another. And I think that that will be uh, that will be very very valuable for all of you. Uh, all right, so let's go into our first lesson tonight and let's talk about the roots of the problem. But before we get there, let's talk about our authors and about what they have to say about the importance of this book and why they spent a decade uh, collecting and translating and publishing during the 70s in the, in the deep, uh, dark days of the Soviet Union. Uh, our fathers, Father Seraph and Father Herman, spent their time uh, struggling in their mountain monastery to bring us the lives of the new martyrs. And this is what, uh, in the preface to the book, Father Herman writes, the testimony of the new martyrs, which often lays bare an intense experience of life in Christ, is the best gift Orthodox Russia has to offer the West. It will not prevent similar things from happening in the West. One can already feel them coming towards us. But it will help us face the sufferings of our godless age with strength, strength and true Christian conviction. And indeed, uh, the the book is filled with things which remind you of the West today, um, the mentality and the perversity uh, and of the perse persecution of Christians uh, without uh, too much of the bloodshed, although that, uh, that may not be far away uh, as, the, as the, uh, the, the totalitarian spirit uh, continues to grow in the West. This is from the act of glorification of the new martyrs of Russia by the Russian church outside of Russia in 1982. And this is from the, uh, the act that I think is very instructive. And so uh, it's also in the text, in our textbook as well. Right away from the very beginning of the revolution, there began a persecution and mockery of the imprisoned czar and his family and almost simultaneously an assault against the representatives of the church, bishops, priests, and believers. In the very first year of the revolution, our church was made pure purple by the blood 
of the overthrown Tsar and his, all his family, and the members of royal blood who were within the boundaries of Russia, as well as numer numberless believers. Later, to them were joined the victims of persecutions from the renovationist schisms and confessors who did not agree to any compromise with the anti-Christian authority. In the attempt of the leaders of the Moscow Patriarchate at that time to serve at one and the same time both Christ and Belial. Then in, uh, then innumerable should be then innumerable choir in an innumerable choir of million many millions of martyrs and confessors was formed during the years of Soviet dom dominion. Tens of thousands of churches and monasteries were destroyed, and millions of people were murdered because they preserved their orthodox faith and did not bow down to the idol of materialism. And what's interesting here, I think, that we, we should focus on just shortly is two things. That to arrive at the point of being a witness to Christ, one has to be have tremendous determination. The kind of determination that you see in the long struggle of the great ascetics of the church. The kind of determination that you see in this, in the, in and faith and trust in God that you see in the great martyrs, the great martyrs of the church. You have to have that and not allow yourself to begin to rationalize and say that one compromise doesn't matter, another compromise doesn't matter. You see, they did not agree with any compromise with the anti-Christian authority. The minute you said, "Well, no, we have to compromise," it's really actually quite wise. To compromise and compromise is not the problem and da, 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 and you get you start going down that road then the spirit of god will recede and you will not have the strength to give the witness and the martyrdom the second thing that i think was is important here that is comes out to the hierarchs act of glorification their words is they did not bow down to the idol of materialism it's very interesting because we have we have a uh, Bolshevik communist state, which is hell bent on uprooting all forms of religion. Of course, orthodoxy was by far the predominant in uh, Russia, <coughs> in the Russian Empire. But uh, what is the, what is the idol that they're being uh, taunted with to bow down to, and that is a purely materialistic outlook, right? The denial of the spirit, the denial of the soul, the denial of eternal life. How different is that from our days? Not much. The prevailing spirit and mentality is one of total disbelief in the uh, eternal life, in the judgment, in uh, the noose, the, the higher aspect of the soul. Uh, and so rationalism and the rational intellect, the scientism of our day is the, is the ultimate authority and the, and the, and the, the pinnacle of which one can arrive in the, in terms of the search for truth in the West, and of course that's the, that's the great lie, and and, and it and it, uh, it is being uh, the Orthodox Christians are being tempted in the West to bow down to that, and to say yes, indeed, the authority that we have, the all authority is Doctor So and So, and the experts, right? Doesn't it's not far from the experts and the tribunals of uh, the uh, communists in terms of the mentality. Now, of course, the persecution is different, and no one, uh, there's no doubt about that, but in terms, in terms of the mentality, in terms of the, the outlook, there's really not much difference. Why do we study about the new martyrs? What does Father Seraphim have to say about that? Why should we study the new martyrs? Before I do that, let's actually read Father Damascene's quote, uh, comment, which is a lead up into his quote, and I think that's it's well put. Father Damascene, uh, the author of the life in English of, and the life and works of Father Seraphim. Behind the Iron Curtain, opposition to Christianity was obvious. Materialism was forced on the people as an ideology. In the West, the enemy was much more subtle. Was much more subtle. Materialism permeated all aspects of life, including religion, and was accepted unconsciously, thus being far more difficult to overcome. 
Father Seraphim believed that by learning how their co-believers in communist countries struggled against the open enemies of their faith, Orthodox Christians in the free world could gain courage to fight their own battles against worldliness and also to endure when more violent persecutions came come to the West as well. So again, a very, uh, according to Father Seraphim, <coughs> excuse me, our author here, uh, and translator of many of the, of the uh, lives, vast majority looks like with Father Herman, is that the key here is that they will give us the courage, the insight, the inspiration, the struggle against worldliness, right? Many people don't, many people don't realize how pervasive secularism, worldliness is in the church and how it undermines and disintegrates the life of the church. And that this is, again, not far in essence from what was going on in the atheist uh, dictatorship of, uh, of the communists. And so there's a great similarity. Uh, methodologically very different at the time, but essentially the same. That's why Father Seraphim will also write, even before it becomes orthodox in the 50s, that communism and capitalism are two sides of the same coin. They're two sides of the same coin of uh, 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 a stance of apostasy from God, uh, uh, atheism and uh, 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 secularism, right? They're two sides of the same coin of, of rejection of the hierarchy, uh, of the uh, established hierarchy that God gives to the world. Uh, so let's see what Father Seraphim says in, 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 in this section. Uh, this is the, uh, all about suffering Russia in the life of Father Seraphim. As I see it, there are two great gifts that God has given people today. In the Soviet world, the difficult gift of suffering, by which God's grace will probably be the salvation of Russia. Which by God's grace will probably be the salvation of Russia. And in the free world, the gift of freedom, to speak and witness to the truth and tell what is going on. How poorly this gift is being used among us. And how soon, perhaps, it will be taken from us. Where, while there is daylight, we must speak out. Very prophetic words from Father Seraphim. Very prophetic words. We see this every day. Anybody who's awake, truly awake, not woke like the culture, but awake spiritually, can see that the gift of freedom is being taken away from the Western, uh, well, people all over the world, really, uh, through this uh, with the opportunity of the COVID crisis throughout the world, right on, on its heels, governments throughout the world are step-by-step step taking away freedom all over the world, making it impossible for you without being followed uh, electronically and surveil under surveillance to do much of anything socially. Uh, I don't know, there's a lot of things on, online, it's actually dizzying the amount of material I get every day and I cannot follow all of it, but there are certain things that come out and stick out in my uh, mind, and that is there is the uh, the insane march toward a um, totalitarian uh, just a justification for totalitarian kind of surveillance and following of everyone in society through these. Uh, the passports, these uh, these applications in your iPhone and your your mobile phone, in which they're going to know exactly where you've been, who you're with. There was one circulating from Saudi Arabia. Someone had shown online exactly what what is it, the, the the application does, and he said that those who had gotten together in groups without, I guess, a blessing of the government or something, uh, that was. That was no, that was understood by the application that you were together in a group of so many people, and perhaps they were not, I don't know, vaccinated or or something, and you were fined. Uh, the, they were able to find you uh, by following you and understanding where you were and who you were with. So this is the kind of things that is in the power of governments today, and some of them are pushing very hard for uh, that, and that's that's something that. The communists would have loved to have at their in their uh, power in their day. So this 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 is a prophetic 
word from uh, Father Seraphim that it will be taken away from us. The days are numbered. And while there is time, we have to use this gift of freedom to speak out and to witness the truth and tell what is going on, both what is going on then in his day in communist Russia, but what is going on all over the world today. Uh, it is a Christian duty to speak out and to tell others and to help others to not overturn, we shouldn't be so naive, to overturn the whole system, but to avoid as much as possible and to get out from under the weight of it as much as possible, to be spiritually free as much as possible from it and to not be in ignorance of it and not be uh, caught unaware so that one simply goes along with it without any kind of resistance. So these are, uh, this is one of the reasons why we're studying the new martyrs, because right here, Father Seraphim telling us it's our duty. It's extremely important for us if we're going to truly battle against the worldliness and the deceptions of the day. Another reason why study the catacomb church. <clears throat> Father Seraphim's interest in the catacomb church was not political. As in everything, it was for him a matter of truth over external appearances. Quote, the catacomb church of Russia is not primarily a rival church organization, which demands a change of Episcopal allegiance, but is first of all the standard bearer of faithfulness to Christ, which inspires a different attitude towards the church and its organization that now prevails throughout much of the Orthodox world. He could be writing today these words, applying them to our situation today. Uh, I have had innumerable people write me and say, Father Peter, should I go to this church because of this stance of this priest or this bishop and all the rest? Uh, and it is exactly this agony of the faithful to remain faithful to Christ that leads them to doubt and to struggle and to and to have have uh, thoughts and 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 problems with the stance of so many in the church today, and so and 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 the answer I've given without having this quote in mind, for the most part, has been it is secondary the question of which local church you're in at this point anyway. It's secondary, <clears throat> still secondary, could change, and what's important is the faithfulness to Christ. And so you have all kinds of unique situations where people, which people are in, trying to determine how, in this particular situation, I will remain faithful to Christ. I think this is an extremely insightful and important comment because it's easy for people, and it happens often for us to want to, and it's I think especially a problem for converts who are coming from the West and very legalistic mentality, very legalistic mentality coming from the Protestant and the Papal Protestant and the Reformed Protestant backgrounds where there's an extreme amount of legalism and moralism, and it and it weighs on people's conscience. They have to be legally pure and, and, and correct. And of course, there is a degree of that that is true. We're not indifferent to the canons of the church, we're not different, but that's not the full, that's not the full picture here. That's not the, the those things are set up so that it leads us into a essentially a spiritual stance. Uh, and I think this is something that Father Seraphim really captures here. Uh, it is a question of faithfulness to Christ, a different attitude toward the church. That's what we see today. Similar, similar problem in the church today. We have different attitudes, different perspectives, different stances. I think the word stance properly describes the problem. What stance do you do you take to the to the life of Christ, to the body of Christ, to the, to the uh, experience of Christ. What does it mean? And, and he says it's, a, it's, a, it's uh, something that prevails through much of the Orthodox world. That, that was true then, it's true today. It's not different. So you see there's a continuum here from the, the temptations and the perversions that we're going to see that happened in the 20s and 30s in Russia. They've not disappeared. There's a continuum. We still are living in, in similar spiritual circumstances. Historical circumstances have certainly changed, but the spiritual reality does not change that drastically. We still have the same struggle and problem today 
and that is the right stance and faithfulness to Christ. Now, one of the authors of the book that we're reading, and really the the, the inspiration for it and the, the base for it, I mean, the first, I think, what, one-fourth of the book is written by Ivan Andreev, I am Andrea. And so I want to say a little bit about him and actually com- give you a little insight into his mind and his his piety, really his ethos, which is which is so invaluable. And what was so invaluable about the Russian emigrants who were coming out of the Soviet Union, he's this man spent time in the catacomb church and in prison in Solovki and speaks and writes of his own experience with the catacomb church in Solovki and the saints that lived there uh, in the years after the declaration of uh, Metropolitan Sergius. So he is an eyewitness to what the catacomb church was in the 30s before he, in the, in the late uh, 30s, uh, emigrated, was able to leave, uh, was released and left the Soviet Union, came to uh, the West. But, and eventually ended up being a, sem- a professor at Holy Trinity Seminary, where I am also a professor and was an in house professor for two years. Uh, and he taught uh, alongside some of the great figures, the great uh, giants of spiritual life that came over from Russia and were in the Russian church abroad. So he's an extremely important. Uh, figure, and I think it's he's imp- it's, it's a great example for us. He is a convert from the intellectual uh, upper echelon, let's say, of the intellectual life there. Very b- brilliant man. He had four degrees, four doctoral degrees, not just four degrees, but four doctoral degrees, which is uh, unheard of, uh, very rare. He was a qualified physician and a psychiatrist, an historian of literature, a philosopher, and a theologian. He was a member, as I said, and a defender of the Catacomb Church. Uh, The central thread of his teaching and his life, especially from the 40s into the 70s when he reposed, was uh, the central thread was the defense of true orthodoxy. The defense of true orthodoxy, right? This is what we should all be about, right? Not, Not, again, not a... Uh, uh, a movement or a institution, but true orthodox dogma and ethos, the way of life. For him, true orthodoxy was not a catchword and not simply a means of preserving himself from apostasy. That, that, that unfortunately is the case for some, that they have a negative, uh, a minimalistic, let's say, approach to the question of true orthodoxy, right? They want to they want to have it like as a uh, a banner that they that they carry along with us, and they and they they shout out, "We're, we're the true Orthodox." And this is not what we're talking about. This is superficial and worldly, actually. No, this is much deeper. And he deeply realized that, as the Lord says in the Gospels, "Whosoever would preserve his soul shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his soul for my sake shall find it." And he spent his life losing his soul for the sake of the Lord and his brethren. Having experienced deeply and fully the attraction of the best of modern wisdom, he ended not only by renouncing it, but by surpassing it. It's easy to renounce what is wrong. It's hard to surpass it and live fully, positively the life in Christ. And this, of course, happens when we make the wisdom of the Holy Fathers are our own wisdom. We enter into their life, and we, we acquire their mind, which is the mind of Christ. That's what it means to be an Orthodox Christian. That's what it means to follow, uh, to follow Holy Fathers is what it means to be an Orthodox Christian. So this is a, a, a very uh, important figure for the 20th century Orthodoxy, which I think many people are ignorant of. They don't know much about him. Of course, some of his, many of his things are not translated into English, so unfortunately we're not, uh, English speakers are not able to enter in. But there, what is translated, is very valuable. And uh, so another reason for all of you to download and read the text, the Russian Catacomb Saints. Now, this is an excerpt from uh, the introduction in the Russian Catacomb Saints. And I'm, it's a story basically uh, that was written, uh, an article that was written by uh, Andreev, which I think is not about the Catacomb Saints per se, it's about the stance of the Christian before great evil. 
And so that very, very much is appropriate for our talk tonight. But it's also revealing as to who the man was, the depth of his uh, sensitive soul and the ethos that he carried. And I think it's very instructive. I was, I remember reading this book. It's my third time reading this book now. The first time I read it, the second time I, I came back again and again to this story as one of the most uh, compelling of the entire uh, book, actually. So I, I, I want to lead with this because I think it's going to set the stage, set the tone, as it were, for our course. And it's very important for us to have the right stance, the right outlook, if we're going to understand the, uh, the new martyrs. All right, so let's, let's read the story. Uh, essentially, it's just excerpts from the story because it's not fully translated. A 29-year-old mother in New York City, in a fit of rage, beat to death her two-month-old son, leaving him unimaginably deformed. She expressed no regret over her crime. This is something that this is 1960s, 70s is writing. How much more today? We have these senseless crimes, this insanity of the modern world. And he says, people have become deaf to sufferings, the insensitivity of the world today. They either do not hear, that should be hear, or do not wish to hear about what is done, not in a nightmare, but in reality. All for one and one for all are guilty. This is the essence of the social ethic of Christianity. We're all guilty, for we're all sinful. We do evil, contribute our evil to the universal storehouse of evil. Let me read that again. We contribute our evil to the universal storehouse, quote unquote, storehouse of evil. And this evil accumulates into an immense universal energy of evil and seeks for its incarnation in the vessels of bodies without grace. And when it finds them, it becomes incarnate in them, and they perform great evil deeds. Let each one think of himself. What were you doing on that evening when this unbelievable but true authentic evil deed was performed? Perhaps it was your sin, your immoral deed, your malice, which turned out to be the last little drop which caused the vessel of evil to overflow. This is the way we must reflect if we are Christians. I love this. This is so important. It's so far from moralism and legalism. It's so far from Pharisaism and hypocrisy. Right? It, is, it, is, it is so important. Let's, let's go on. I don't want to stop. Uh, we'll come back and comment at the end. Let's see. Weep, brothers and sisters. Do not be ashamed of these tears. Weep. And let these tears be the fount in which the Lord will baptize the child martyr, who was probably unbaptized, being chrismated in place of oil with his innocent child's blood. Weep. Let your tears also be a fount of a different energy. An energy of good that fights against the energy of evil, which by its power will save at least one child from innocent tortures and at least one criminal mother from an unforgivable sin. Let these tears also awaken many of the indifferent. Do not be ashamed to weep with tears of grief and compassion and repentance. This is so it's incredibly important. Uh, you see how the activist, moralist approach is totally absent here. How the spiritual, the deep spiritual insight into the into the unity of mankind, into the into the spiritual struggle behind uh, all of the physical destruction that goes on in the world, the sensitivity to the uh, to the fact that. Every one of us contributes either negatively or positively, either through sin or through virtue, to the sta state of the world. And no one can stand aside and say, I have nothing to do with this. It's not no, none of, no concern to me uh, what is happening uh, here or there or uh, on the other side of the earth. We're all one 
body of humanity and in the church we're all in christ brothers and sisters only in the church is that spiritual family that spiritual relationship established and so even more so with that spiritual connection we are co-responsible in the church if something is happening that's evil in your time or place uh in your church in your parish in your family in your community and you stand aside and say it has nothing to do with me i'm not responsible are you co-response are you connecting and and identifying as as we see here in the story by andrev do you have this stance so we think so legalistically and and and, and moralistically about christ and and the spirit of god and the, and the spiritual life we miss this message this is such an important message and if we're going to properly understand the greatness of the new martyrs and why some people will say well, what's the point what was the point of of standing up and confessing it didn't change anything there was it would have been more wise to do what Sergius did and to protect the buildings and the status of the church and all the rest, right? Because uh, it was obviously fruitless, it was pointless to try to fight against this, this, this bestial power that would rip everything apart in its path. And yet that approach is a rationalistic, legalistic approach, doesn't understand the connection, doesn't understand the importance of repentance and the stance. This is a stance that one has throughout one's life. This is not something that comes and goes. This is an outlook, a stance of a Christian uh, of repentance. Uh, and when the Lord calls us to repentance, he's not calling us to that moralistic, legalistic, rationalistic stance of so many. He's calling us to this. He's calling us to feeling we are co-responsible for all of humanity and especially all of those who are brothers and sisters in Christ and that we are co-responsible for the state of the world, the state of our brothers and sisters. How much more in our family? Right? We stand oftentimes in judgment of our children or our wife or our husband. We do not have this stance of repentance, of self-knowledge, how we are all co-responsible for what goes on. If your children, your brothers and sisters, your wife, it doesn't don't, do not understand, do not follow the path, do things that are evil, do things that are sinful. How do you approach them? Do you say that's their problem, how sinful they are, how bad they are, like the Pharisee, the hypocrite? Or do you say, it's I am the cause of them not being closer to Christ because I do not use my time and, and the gifts that God has given me, my freedom to be a, uh, a spiritual bomb for all of those around me. So this is an amazing uh, insight on the part of, of our, uh, our, uh, our author of our text. I think it's important that we keep it in mind as we go through the whole book. It also shows the greatness of his soul. And uh, hopefully this, this will be helpful to you. All right, let's go to the spiritual root causes of the revolution. This is where we need to start. How did we arrive? How did Russia arrive to throw off the their emperor, turn them, their back on Christ, and to embrace nihilism. As, as it was said, I think, by Father Seraphim, communism, what was really going on there is not just the ideology of communism or even atheism, it's nihilism, right? And nihilism is common to the whole world, and it's definitely alive and well and has been thoroughly embraced in the Western world. So there's that commonality. Right? We're not looking at a something that's, totally foreign to us when we go into uh, at all uh, and look at the, uh, uh, the time of the uh, persecution of the church in Russia. Now, let's listen to the prophetic words of St. John of Kronstadt before the revolution, decades before the revolution, telling the people in Russia what will come if they do not repent. Russia has forgotten the saving God and has lost faith in him abandoned the law of God, enslaved itself to all sorts of passions, deified blind human reason, deified blind human reason, sounds very familiar, familiar to me. It has replaced God's all-wise, holy, and righteous will with the phantom of sinful freedom, open up wide 
the doors to all manner of outrage, and therefore it will become immeasurably impoverished and be shamed before the whole world. The worthy reward for its pride, for its slumber, inaction, venality, and coldness toward God's church. God will punish us for our sins. The sovereign lady will not stretch forth her hand to help us. Prophetic words from St. John. He goes on. Russia can be called the kingdom of the Lord. This is, of course, on the one hand. On the other, because of their godlessness and impiety, many Russians, the so-called intelligentsia, who have strayed from the right path, apostatize from the faith, and mock it in every way. Having trampled upon all the gospel commandments and allow all kinds of depravity into our life, the Russian kingdom is not the Lord's kingdom, but a broad and far-flung kingdom of Satan. For all of these blind nationalists who look at their country and their people as never doing wrong, no matter how apostate they are, listen to St. John and let's humble ourselves. There are those who are reacting against the evil in, in a methodology in a way that is equally worldly and unproductive. They come and they, they react against, uh, in our day, the, reaction, the, uh, the accusations of uh, whatever it might be, uh, right, racism or uh, the various isms that, are, that the, that the uh, Antichrist of our day accused the Christians of. And instead of having the stance of St. John, instead of seeing that we Christians are responsible for much of this, if not all of it, they turn around and react and essentially fulfill uh, the same mentality. It's very important for us to enter into the ethos and spirit of the saints here. He goes on, Russia, if you fall away from your faith, as many of the intellectual class have already fallen away, you will no longer be Russia or Holy Russia. And if there will be no repentance in the Russian people, then the end of the world is near. God will take away the pious czar, and he will send a whip in the person of impious, cruel, self-appointed rulers who will inundate the whole world with blood and tears. How amazingly accurate the, prof the prophetic words of St. John are. What an amazing saint. If you don't have the writings of St. John, you don't have for life in Christ, my life in Christ, <clears throat> I highly, highly encourage you to go and buy it and read it on a daily basis. Just read a page a day. St. Isaac the Syrian, a page a day, according to Elder Hieronymus of Aegina. St. John of Cronstadt, I tell you, a page a day for all of us. His insights are amazing. And here he's calling us all in today. Same message. Always the message of repentance. The repentance is the, is the one message that is always first and foremost from the Christian and the preacher and the teacher and the bishop. And when it's lacking, then we have serious, serious problems. We don't even teach and preach repentance. How will we come to our self-knowledge and come to our senses? St. Macarius of Moscow and the Altai, a great missionary, the great missionary who was uh, proposed in the 26, I think, uh, was glorified by the church in 2000. Uh, and in just the time before uh, the... Uh, Tribulation really took off. I think it was 1918. I think he's writing. And he's saying to the people at the time, we are now experiencing times of trouble. Russia has survived periods of tribulation, but they are never, they were never as dangerous as today. Then everyone was for God. Everyone wished to know his will, but today it is different. Then they supported the czar. Today that has changed. Today we hear blasphemy against God and plots against his anointed one. So that's a high eyewitness, the Metropolitan of Moscow, right on the eve, essentially, of the terrible tribulation in 1918, 1919, and, and, and beyond. And then we go to St. John, the great wonder worker, of San Francisco, Shanghai, San Francisco, in his famous and very important article called The Meaning of the Russian Diaspora. And we're not going to be able to read it all, obviously. I highly encourage you. It's in issue 50 of the Orthodox Word. You can find, again, online, just do a search, Orthodox Word, um, 
online. There's a whole in archives. It's archives. That's what it is. You can find all 50. You can read all 50 of them online. All uh, was 100, 108, I think, uh, something like that. St. John talks about the cause of the Russian Revolution, the great sins, oath-breaking and regicide. Those who are who are bound to support the Russian uh, czar, the monarch, broke their oaths and they turned on and killed their uh, God-appointed sovereign. Uh, those guilty of the sin of regicide are not only those who physically performed it, but the whole people which rejoiced on the occasion of the overthrow of the czar. The catastrophe which has come upon Russia is the direct consequence of terrible sins, and the rebirth of Russia is possible only after cleansing from them. However, up to this time, there has been no genuine repentance. The crimes that have been performed have clearly not been condemned. It is not expressing a direct condemnation of the February Revolution, the uprising against the anointed of God. The Russian people continue in not expressing this. The Russian people continue to participate in the sin. You see, this is almost a spiritual law. It is a spiritual law that when sin is committed and there's no repentance, then the rights of the enemy, the rights of the devil, the power over humanity continues. Without true repentance, there's no freedom. Without true repentance, there's no freedom. St. John goes on, a significant part of the Russians who went abroad belonged to that intellectual class which in recent times has lived by the ideas of the West. Now, I, we're going to talk a little about this because it's important for us today to realize the, the plight of orthodoxy in the West, which is not much different than the plight of orthodoxy before the fall. All right? So it is the same sickness, the, 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 the exaltation of rationalism in all spheres of the church life, not just outside of the church. While belonging to the Orthodox Church and confessing themselves to be Orthodox, the people of this class, the intellectual class, in their world outlook, significantly departed from orthodoxy. The chief sin of the people of this class was that they did not build their convictions and way of life on the teaching of the orthodox faith, but rather strove to make the rules and teaching of the orthodox church conform to their own habits and desires. Therefore, on the one hand, they were but very little interested in the essence of orthodox teaching, often even considering the dogmatic teaching of the church as being completely unimportant. Now, on the other hand, they fulfilled the demands and rights of the Orthodox Church, but only insofar as they did, as this did not interfere with their more European way of life than Russian way of life. All right, so it's 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 not at all different than many Orthodox Christians in the West today, and probably much worse today. That the Church is cut to their degrees or level, right? They they lower it down to the lowest level social level it's a it's an emptying of the spiritual life an emptying of the higher things this the obedience to to god and just a total uh uprooting and and hollowing of the life of the church where we have just a externalism a, a superficial uh, uh and and cultural and uh, uh following of the church life for many many people he goes on in the public realm this class likewise lived by the ideas of the West. Without giving any place at all for the influence of the church, it strove to reconstruct the whole life of Russia. It strove to reconstruct the whole life of Russia, especially in the realm of state government, according to Western models. For this reason, in recent times, an especially fierce battle has waged, was waged against state authority, at the same time, the necessity for liberal reforms and at the democratic organization of Russia became, as it were, a new faith. Not to confess, which signified that one was behind the times. That one was behind the times. Making use of their battle with the monarchy of a slander against the imperial family, which was widely spread throughout Russia, and likewise being possessed by a thirst for power, the intellectual class led imperial Russia to its fall and prepared the way for the communist power, all right? So we're getting to the root. What's the root of the problem here? He goes on, he talks about now in the diaspora, but it's, it's applicable to what happened in, in Russia as well and what's happening today. 
<clears throat> and he's talking about the English class, in particularly the, the delusion and heresy of sophiology, which was a minor thing he says, right? It's, a, it's, it's comparatively few people appropriated it, but the stance is what's interesting here. Uh, a significant part of the intellectual class of the immigration is spiritually akin to it. For the psychology of psych sociology is the worship of man, who is no longer the humble slave of God, but is himself a small God, who has no need to be blindly submissive to the Lord God. A feeling of refined pride. A feeling of refined pride bound up with faith in the possibility for a man to live by his own wisdom is very characteristic of many people who are, quote, cultural in the modern sense, who place above everything else the conclusions of their own minds and do not desire to be in everything submissive to the teaching of the church. Now, what we can see this in our contemporary situation very clearly. When we talk about the need to follow the Holy Fathers, that's what it means to be submissive to the teaching of the church, to follow the saints, to listen to the saints. For all of us, bishops, priests, and deacons, and lay people, and everyone, theologians, to bow before the words and the witness and the teachings and the examples of the saints. That's what he's saying here. That's what people don't do. And that's why we have a total secularized church. It's really that simple. We become disciples of Christ by becoming disciples of the saints. We become disciples of Christ by submitting and following the Holy Fathers and the Saints. That's how it works. It's not, there's no other way. Everything else is delusional. Everything else reminds us of, of a Protestant with his Bible and, say, and thinking that by him reading the Bible and trying to apply it, he's following Christ. But that's impossible because Christ didn't give a Bible, but he gave a church and he gave disciples and he gave the disciples the power of binding and loosing. You have to be their disciples to be his disciples. He goes on, in the future life, the judgment will be most severe for those Russians who, being educated in superb colleges, become the fiercest enemies of Russia. One is forced to foresee already that in the future, the diaspora will give many conscious workers against Orthodox Russia, who will strive to make it Catholic, apostate, apostate papal Protestant, in other words, or spread various sects. And likewise, those who, while remaining outwardly Orthodox and Russian, will secretly work against Russia. But Russia was founded on and grew through Orthodoxy, and only Orthodoxy, only Orthodoxy will save Russia. Another great witness. This is just about an excerpt. Unfortunately, there's not enough time. We're already an hour and 15 minutes in. We want to open up the questions, but we have a few more we want to present before we go to a short review of the timeline and give some historical uh, perspective. This is a new martyr, St. John Vostorgov, Vostorgov, I don't know how you say that properly in Russian, of Moscow. And he's a he was a gifted orator, gift, give, gifted homilist, and he gave a homily uh, on the eve of his martyrdom, and this is an excerpt from that. Those, there's much more I would, that, that is worthy. If you can look them up and follow and find this, I think uh, um, there is a version, a whole version of the lecture or the homily online, you can find it. Those who seized power after the overthrow of the monarch have carried out their own will. So this is, this is just 1918, 1970, 1918, right after the uh, October Revolution. They are responsible for it before history, before the people before God. But God has allowed them to carry out their reward both on us and themselves. Just like the ancient peoples who had been instruments in the, of the punishment of Israel, they have split up endlessly in front of our eyes, overthrowing each other. And in the course of a year, they have covered the distance which in antiquity would have required 500 years. He's talking about the general upheaval of, of people being uh, coming to power and very quickly being th thrown down, being exiled, being killed until the Bolsheviks, and, th and even after the Bolsheviks, uh, this, it, it, this chaos, this anarchy re reigned. But listen to what he said there. God has allowed them to carry out this because they've become instruments of punishment of Israel, instrument of punishments of the Russian people. And this is very important for us to understand that the the 
um, nothing happens without God being allowing it to happen. So this COVID insanity that we've lived, and now we're we're going and we're seeing the totalitarianism of the states, the various states of the world rising. Thank God, there's been a, a more and more of a healthy reaction against it, and and, and with these um, insane uh, measures and the new vaccine uh, craze, uh, which is going to unfortunately bring damage to many, many human beings, I fear. Uh, all of this is being allowed by God for some reason, because there is no, no other way to bring about the salvation of the world. This is hard for us to grasp, but because of our pride and arrogance, because of our apostasy, nothing is left. We freely walk this path. We freely allow the devil to walk naked through our sins. And so what is left in the pedagogy of God? And this is what's happened repeatedly in the ancient Israel. Anyone who's familiar with the text of the Old Testament, again and again and again, the prophets preached repentance, the people fell away and worshiped idols. Again, they came back, again, they fell away. This is the pedagogy of the Lord. He says, if you do not listen, you do not obey, what else is there? And I desire your salvation, so therefore, the events happen. And this is what he's saying here, a very important message for us today. Immediately declaring us themselves out, he goes on, immediately declaring themselves outside God in every religion, they have constructed a tower of Babylon and a Babylonian Babel and have arrived at mutual incomprehension and complete division. It was easy to scramble into the throne of power, but it has turned out to be very difficult to remain sitting on it. As, as it is in general difficult to sit on the point of a sword or bayonet. And God, oh God, how terrible has your righteousness, ju righteous judgment been in this year. Everybody has received his due reward and chained, some, chained himself with his own hands. That's a description from a priest in Moscow right after the revolution. Now we have one of the catacomb saints and bishops uh, believed by many to be a bishop in the catacomb church, lived up in the 19, I think, 60s or 70s, I forget when he reposed. And he talks about the causes of the revolution. Listen to what he says. And the, and the whole destruction of Orthodox Russia. Do you think that those who destroyed churches and monasteries are to blame? No, they are not to blame. There is no one to keep to restrain them. When there were honest monks and nuns in the monasteries, then the Lord, for their sake, these few people suffered, endured the sins of all the other people. But when they were gone, the Lord did not tolerate any longer and threw off the rest of the people. Let the people not be angry with the Lord but be angry with their deeds, let them repent. Let the people not be angry with the Lord. This is one of the scandals of the, of the last times. There are many scandals that people are suffering through. And one of the scandals is, where is the Lord? Where is God? Why doesn't he intervene? Someone just asked me in a talk I gave uh, online on Sunday night to a group of non-Orthodox in, in the UK. And he was just, he could not understand. He, he was not, not Christian or Orthodox. I'm not even sure he was Christian. And he said, why is it allowed for these evil people to do such evil things in our day, for people to die and people to die, innocent people to die? And he was clearly scandalized. And this will be the scandal of many. Many people will fall away because they will not be able to understand the spiritual laws, the spiritual reality of this world and how things work, the freedom that God gives humanity, and they will turn against God for that reason. They will be scandalized. We must not allow that to happen. We must not be angry with the Lord. We must not be angry with the ones who have not been restrained because of because ultimately we are co-responsible. We, the faithful who do not struggle, do not repent, do not fast, do not pray, do not pray for our Brothers and sisters, let alone those who persecute us. We should be angry with ourselves. We should repent. This is the message of Vladika and all of the great saints of the church. This is the 
perennial message, um, St. Siloam the Athenite, if you've read his writings, same message. Now, we end with Archbishop of Verki, the great um, teacher and prophetic voice from the monastery in Jordanville, talking about, again, the causes, the roots of uh, the, uh, the revolution. Let's listen to what Archbishop Verki has to say. A great many different, more or less weighty and plausible ideas have been and continue to be expressed on the causes of the terrible bloody catastrophe which befell our motherland, Russia, in 1917. Usually and most frequently, causes of an economic and political nature are presented for consideration. And people think that it, it all is satisfactory and completely explained by them. By the way, I was just reading, I think, and I don't remember, I think it was two years ago, on public orthodoxy, a Russian lady was writing in reaction to the Russian Church Abroad uh, hierarchy's uh, declaration on the 100th anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution. And this reminds me so much of what she was saying. Looking at these kind of factors and not understanding the spiritual life at all that goes on. But as for us Russian believers, there cannot be the slightest doubt that these causes, if in fact they existed, were only secondary, derivative, attendant causes, but certainly not the chief, the fundamental, or the basic ones. The chief cause of all the woes which befall a man and deprive him of peace and prosperity is his departure, his departure, from the single source of life and well-being, our creator, provider, and savior, God and his flouting of the divine laws and rules, which are man's only salvation. And this is just the beginning of the article. It's a beautiful thing. You ought to look it up and read it, Archbishop Verki of Jordanville on uh, the causes of the revolution. And he goes on and speaks. But here is the, the, the spiritual core, this, the, the main message, which then he, he develops, and which we all need to listen to. Um, we look at all kinds of things in the world and we say, what are the causes of uh, COVID, of totalitarian systems, of the vaccination, mass vaccination? There's all kinds of many reasons, but they're secondary. And it's good for us to know them. It's good for us to analyze them, to understand them, but they're secondary. The hierarchy of things is very clear. Spiritual is, high, is the highest, the most profound, the most important. From, from that, everything else flows. So we have to acquire this, the mind of the, of the fathers and understand things spiritually. And then we begin to live spiritually. We begin to understand how we should live. We become part of the solution. We become a uh, part of the salvation of our own souls and, and the world. All right, let me finish up today by just going over a little bit about the history. So I'm going to share with you... Um, this timeline from the Russian uh, Orthodox Studies uh, website, but I've added a few things from orthodoxhistory.com. If you are on social media, I posted at the end of my uh, Orthodox resources today, uh, I posted these two links, very important for us. I highly recommend that you all go and read these two timelines. Again, one is from the uh, website um, of Russian, I, I just, the name just escaped me, hang on, let me see. One is Orthodox history, nine years that almost destroyed the Orthodox church. And the other is, where is it? Rokor studies, timeline of the Orthodox church, 1917 to 1998. All right, so those are the two, uh, two texts that I'm using here. And uh, I've kind of combined them here, but mainly it's from the Rokor Studies website. Now, th these are really quickly and, 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 and superficially, I'm going to go through these. And, but I, I, again, I recommend you go and look at it on your own and, and check it out. So this is February of 1970. World War I is raging. Revolution in Russia is topple, topples the great Romanov dynasty. 
The Tsar and his family were kept under house arrest until the second revolution in October of this year, when the Bolsheviks seized total power. More moderate elements nominally controlled the Russian state, and the Orthodox Church was not yet overly persecuted. This is 1917, all right? We're talking about 1970. Very quickly, however, things deteriorate. At the same time this is all going on, they have the, uh, the council, the Russian Orthodox Council in the in Moscow, and they're called together hundreds and hundreds, one of the largest in its history. Um, you can see here 500, 584 members, 68 of whom were bishops. This is the All-Russian Council, which then elected Patriarch Tikhon. He became the first patriarch after hundreds of years because in Russia they had the state. Now, this is not unimportant to what we're talking about. The state, Peter the Great and, and his, and his uh, uh, the czars the, the, uh, after him, had done away with the patriarchy. Is this unrelated to the fall of the Roman Empire? Yeah, I don't think so. We have to be severely critical of our own house and understand what led to these things. So they, they bring him back. They bring the patriarchate back. St. Tikhon is the first patriarch. And this council is happening literally as the um, pictures from the council, literally as the Bolsheviks are taking power. And uh, you see in the picture here, St. Tikhon in the middle and Metropolitan Anthony Krepovitsky, the founder essentially of the Russian Church Abroad. He's the first hierarch of the Russian Church Abroad, along with many other hierarchs in the diaspora with the blessing of St. Tikhon. But he's to the he's to the right, looking at St. Tikhon to the right is Metropolitan Anthony Krepovitsky, a very important figure, one of the most important theological figures in the first half of the 20th century in all of the Orthodox churches, revered, respected by the Orthodox patriarchs in the East, uh, who he knew and had good relations with. Uh, and it was a really pivotal and important figure for the Russian uh, Russian Orthodoxy in the 20th century. And the um, just as the Bolsheviks were storming Moscow and taking the city by force, this Russian, all-Russian council is meeting in the city. Imagine the just the intensity of everything. Uh, it's just it's just uh, it's hard to. Uh, just just thinking about it is is, is mind boggling. But how, living it must have been amazing, and 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 uh, nerve wracking <laughs> to say the least. The uh, uh, first martyr was actually a missionary to America. He was he was a priest in the Holy Trinity in Chicago, and in 1917 he was the dean of the cathedral near St. Petersburg, and he was the first martyr. You can have an image of him here, uh, St. John. Um, Kulturov, if I'm saying that correctly, the first priest martyr was killed by the Bolsheviks in 1917 in November, just after the October Revolution. At this time, there were 51,450 churches in Russia, 51,450 churches all over Russia. By, the 19, by 1940, there will be 500. Think about that number. 51,000. 20 years later, 22, three, three years later, 500 churches are left. They've been destroyed. They've been transformed into what a number of godless things uh, or mundane things. That alone, that statistic alone is just mind-boggling. So St. Tikhon, there you go, a picture of him. He's elected, becomes the rudder holder of the ship of, the, of Christ in Russia. These are some of the things that were passed by the All Russian Council in an attempt to come back in some areas to the holy tradition that had been distorted uh, since the 1700s. And I won't really get into these, not, not so important, but the restoration of the patriarchate, of course, is extremely important. And um, the reestablishment of Orthodox ecclesiology in many ways. Right there, right after this, 1918, we have the beginning of the Red Terror, where they start to really go after the church, and we have many, many martyrs. Uh, Patriarch Tikhon calls them out, calls them to repentance, anathematizes them, the Bolsheviks, who are creating all this havoc, the beginning of 1918. So just a few months after, just a few months after, he immediately anathematizes and, and excommunicates all of the Bolsheviks, of course, the Bolsheviks were not Orthodox Christians, or they were apostates if they were. 
Uh, many of them were actually uh, uh, ethnically Jewish, including uh, Trotsky and Lenin. Lenin. Uh, but there were others who were Russians, like Stalin. And he says, do not enter into communion with the scum of the earth. And very strong words from Patriarch Tikhon. You can imagine the war that is going on in Russia at the outset. First, uh, one of the first bishops, if not the first bishop who was martyred, was Metropolitan Vladimir of Kiev. You see the icon of him here. He was executed by the firing squad, uh, and he was praying as he as he was killed for his uh, assassins. The Russian Church Council supported the anathemas issued by Patriarch Tikhon. Uh, at the same time, this is all going on. I want to give you a little context. To understand what's going on in the rest of the Orthodox world, there's great upheaval all over the Orthodox world. You've got, first of all, World War I brought tremendous upheaval. But you have all kinds of upheaval in the churches. One of the things that's going on in uh, in Greece and then in the Ecumenical Patriarchate in 1922 and 23 is the very unfortunate and very problematic uh, person of Miletios Metexakis, the future Patriarch of Constantinople and then Patriarch of Alexandria. One of the most divisive and deluded uh, figures in in church history, uh, who brought tremendous division to the church, was the reason why there was a, a uh, calendar innovation and uh, change, uh, and um, the calendar change brought, of course, great division to the Orthodox Church. So this is going on at the same time. You have things going on in Israel. You have the beginning of these the mandate, the Balfour. This, uh, uh, what's it called, the, the Balfour Mandate, the Balfour Decision, which is, begins the process of establishing the state of Israel. And, of course, that brings all kinds of havoc to the uh, to the Patriarchate of Jerusalem. Um, I really recommend you, you take time, you look through this 1917, 1925, some of the most important years of the Orthodox Church, why many of the things we're suffering through today have their origins in these days. Ecumenism, 1920, the encyclical of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, which was a heretical, an heretical uh, encyclical, to this day is is lauded by many, unfortunately, in the church, but has heretical ideas within it. And this is the same time, 1920. Uh, there's just tremendous upheaval in the world and in the churches in many places around uh, the Orthodox world. And so uh, you have to understand the context to understand the, the difficulties also for the church in Russia. The next um, great hierarch uh, martyr is Bishop Hermogenes of Tobolsk. Uh, we actually uh, have quoted him in our past uh, lectures in the Orthodox Survival Course. Tremendous uh, uh, figure in the Orthodox Church. He was drowned uh, and uh, not unlike the ancient martyrs. M many, many of these martyrs remind us of the ancient martyrs in the church. Of course, Tsar Nicholas, Shortly thereafter, in July of, eight, of 1918, is uh, and his whole family is are executed or slaughtered by the by the communists. And then the next day, Saint Elizabeth and Saint Barbara thrown into a uh, mine shaft and martyred. Uh, Archbishop jo Joachim of Novgorod, 50 priests, 42 uh, in the Diocese of Perm. And, and this is now middle of the 18, we're only about seven months after the Bolsheviks have taken power and we're having uh, the beginning of, of many, many um, martyrdoms for the, the faithful, for the, for the church there. Um, the end of this year in Russia, 1918, Metropolitan, eight bishops, over 200 priests, 300 deacons, and over 400 monks and nuns were murdered became martyrs of the church. 26 monasteries were closed. And we have an icon of the holy uh, royal martyrs. Now we go to 19. We're, we're going to go through 20, and then we'll, we'll pick up the timeline in the next lesson. We're just going to look at some, some of the events here in 1919 and 1920. May 18th to 24th in 19, 1919, we have... Uh, a temporary church administration was formed because of the civil war that's going on. We have a civil war between the white and the red uh, forces. The white, of course, the, the supporting the monarchy. And so there's a lot of chaos in Russia. People are cut off. Uh, the, the communist leaders were making blasphemous 
blasphemy, blasphemously creative efforts to undermine the Orthodox Church. Just a few of them, just to give you a sense. They staged a mock wedding between an elderly priest and a horse, and they forced the people to sing the wedding hymns under threat of death. In Moscow, they published a parody of the Orthodox funeral service for a dog. In a church in North, the North Caucasus, they bayoneted the mouth of Christ in an icon and inserted a cigarette. In some churches, the communists desecrated the holy places by holding drunken orgies. During this period of persecution, numerous saints' relics were seized and desecrated and exposed supposedly as fraudulent by the communists. The Bolsheviks weren't just mocking the church, though. There were murderous rampages going on. In Kharkov, a priest was executed for criticizing the Bolsheviks. When his wife came to retrieve his body, the Bolsheviks dismembered her as she was still alive. They executed her after torturing her. In another incident, an elderly priest was tied to a telegraph pole and shot to death, and his body was fed to dogs. This is just a few examples. Obviously, there are thousands of people in 1990, 1920, being slaughtered by the communists in a variety of ways, and of course, many sent into exile and all the rest. So we're just giving a small, small sample of what was going on. The demonic had been released to an unbelievable degree in Russia. The, the torture and the, the it, it absolutely reminds you of the ancient church and the satanic, demonic um, a methodology of the idol worshippers. Um, unfortunately, the beginning of the saga of the church with the new calendar during this time, I mentioned about the uh, Archbishop Maletius, who was the Archbishop of Athens before he became Patriarch of Constantinople. Uh, at the time, Metropolitan Anthony was imprisoned, but then he was let free again uh, when uh, liberated by the White Army for a time. When the Red Army took over the city of Voronezh, they murdered the Archbishop of Voronezh, Tikhon, by hanging him on the royal gates. 160 priests were killed with him. At the end of 1919, 20 bishops had been martyred, 1,000 priests, 58 relics consecrated. Just, just a few statistics here, just to give you a sense of what's happening, and desecrated. 1920, Patriarch Tikhon has granted autonomy to the Estonian church and made Archbishop Alexander its head. This is a whole other history about the Estonian church because at the same time, uh, Meletus Matesakis is interfering in the Estonian near Finland and giving them autocephaly and creating a schism, which to this day is still affecting the church there. Uh, the White Army evacuates from southern Russia. 150,000 immigrants. Uh, they fl flee, uh, a fleet of refugees come to the walls of Constantinople in 1920. The first session of the higher church administration outside the borders of Russia takes place in 1920, November, November 19th. This is what will come, become the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia. Metropolitan Anthony Kravitsky is the eldest there, Metropolitan Platon of Odessa, Archbishop Theophan of Poltava, Bishop Benjamin of Sevastopol are those who take part. And about at the end of 20, we have about 200,000 Russian refugees left Russia with the retreating white army in southern Siberia and crossed the Russian Chinese border with many priests and six bishops. So you have people exiting in Russia, in China. You have people exiting in Crimea, going to Constantinople. <clears throat> you have eventually three million Russian refugees leave Russia during this time with the retreating white army. And they are scattered throughout the world, Australia, America, Europe. And this is the uh, what St. John was talking about, the uh, fruit of, there's bad fruit, but there's also good fruit. And this was to bring the gospel, the Orthodox faith, to the four corners of the earth. St. John talks about this in his article. All right, so that's enough for today. We've already gone over time. We'll open it up to questions. If you have questions, you can write it down, either in the... Uh, uh, YouTube and other uh, social media, or you can send it through our crowd crowdcast. We have some questions there from our, um, our brothers and sisters who are following there. So we'll open it up to questions. And one of them, the first question is,
A lot of Russians are fail, falling into capitalist secularism. Is Russia going to repeat its mistake? Uh, I don't know. I'm not a prophet, uh, but and it's not really it's not really connected that much to the to the question of the martyrs. But I could speculate that um, there's very little. It seems to me holding uh, things back to push uh, Russia toward more and more of the capitalist system, but I'm not, a, I'm not an expert in that, so I don't really want to speculate too much. I don't know. God help us. Another question. Does God call us to endure the persecution that befalls upon our geographical place of living? Or are we called to be seeking out less persecuted states, regions, cities, or countries to migrate to? If we are always fleeing our geographical place of struggle or martyrdom, could this be considered as a form of spiritual cowardice? So you look at the life of, for instance, St. Cyprian of Carthage. He was a martyr eventually, but initially he fled. He went to the mountains and he, 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 he was in hiding. So you see that in the life of a, a, one of the great martyrs of the African church, you had a time when he fled. And so is there, a, is there some kind of general response to that? No, it's called discernment. Each one of us has to discern. And if in our heart, in our soul, we're fleeing out of cowardice, then obviously our conscience will tell us and that's not blessed. But if we're doing it out of discernment for some other reason, for the fake, sake of the faithful, for instance, in St. Cyprian's case, I think he was doing it out of the sake of the church. Uh, perhaps there, was, there were pastoral reasons why he did not want to yet depart. So it depends, depends uh, it, what is our stance. If our stance is worldly and cowardice, then fleeing is not blessed. But if it's not, it, before the persecution happens, I don't think there's anything wrong. I think it's quite wise. We get to be humble to seek to come close to places where we're going to be spiritually supported. For instance, if you're living far from your parish and you're not able to attend services on a regular basis, it is praiseworthy to organize your life around the church, to move, to be close to the community, to be able to be a part of the community and to pray more often, to become spiritually strengthened. Or if you have the desire to go and live next to one of the monasteries, because you wanna have as much access to daily services as possible and have, have access to spiritual guidance, that's an honorable thing. It has nothing to do with fleeing uh, persecution. So I think that as, if we have freedom and peace, then it's wise for, for us to take the measures that we need to take to prepare ourselves and to stand in the day of temptation. Another question. Eric Vogue in Science, Politics, and Nazism describes a false religion of scientific materialism and condemns it, which brings me to my question. I'm converting to orthodoxy. How should we respond to orthodox Christians who honor the science above God? Well, as you heard tonight, as you will see in this class, that kind of apostasy and secularism is not consistent with Orthodox teaching, Orthodox saints. We should respond to them with great love and compassion because we are in a day of tremendous apostasy and delusion. We should not stand in judgment of anyone who is suffering from these various spiritual delusions and ail ail ailments. But we should have compassion and love. And insofar as they allow us and they want to hear the truth, we should try to offer it. If they are not interested, if they become angry, then we should stop. Of course, we should never force anyone to listen or to understand that they have to want it. And that's a prerequisite for all knowledge and all wisdom is that they want to be taught by the church. So how can we do that? We can do that in a variety of ways. First of all, we have to become spiritually and intellectually initiated into the mind of Christ, and then present it in a variety of ways, depending on the circumstances, online, through articles, through discussions and all the rest. It's a praiseworthy thing to help others avoid the delusion. It's absolutely connected. People fall away from Christ because they're under the influence and the, the, and the direction of the worldly mindset and spirit. As we saw, the intellectuals were referred to many times by our saints. The intellectuals of Russia are, were considered to be largely responsible, not entirely, of course, 
by any means, but they were the leaders, let's say, in the apostasy. And so it's very uh, important today to give a sound intellectual apology for the Orthodox outlook and the Orthodox perspective and to our brothers and sisters and help them to stay away from delusion. Another question, would you say that it is one thing to locate where and who is behind the evil in the world in order to know how to best navigate it, thus making a religion out of talking about them? It is one thing to locate where and who is behind the evil in the world. You don't know how best to navigate it. Thus making a religion out of talking about them. I'm not really sure the question. The question is not at all clear to me. Um, is there an, is there, are you saying there's a possibility of excess and uh, confusion and losing our way if we become obsessed with the evil and we spend our all our day? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. In the hierarchy of things, you haven't heard me talk about, first and foremost, we have to have a, a thorough intellectual analysis of evil. That's not what's first and foremost. First and foremost is repentance. First and foremost is life in Christ and all the rest. And then God's illumination comes to us. So if we're spending our days and nights all obsessed with the evil, that's not going to not going to lead us to protection from it. Just knowing about it is not enough, right? It's, in, it's important to know. It's important to share with others. It's important for people to be aware. But if that's the majority, if that's the, the weight of our, our work is there, then we've got a problem. We're not going to stand in that day. It's not a question of intellectual knowledge of evil. It's a question of being free from it in our soul and our heart. It's being, it's being purified and illumined within. It will have, it, the, the, the Lord says, the devil came and found no nothing in me. He found no place in me. He had found no, no way to tempt me. The Lord had never given any rights to the enemy. All right? The way that the devil could never do anything to the Lord because he had never sinned. He had never given any rights to the enemy so that he was powerless before the Lord. That's, that's what we have to strive toward. That's when we become in, uh, impenetrable, right? The soul is no longer susceptible to the demonic. Is when we are, have been purified and illumined through a, a, a regiment of spiritual ascetic a, a life, a prayer and fasting. That's first and foremost. That's the basis. Ha the other is added on to it according to our ability, our stage, uh, our uh, station in life, uh, and all the rest. And it, it varies greatly. Uh, it's not enough. And that's what is the problem with outside the church. So many are fighting against the zeitgeist, but they're not going to be successful because they do not have the spirit of God. And they're fighting intellectually and, and poorly. And they will not, they will not be able, most of them will not be able to stand in the day of temptation. It's not enough. You've got to have the Spirit of God to resist the demonic uh, in the world. And to, and to confess, right? Like but those who denied Christ in the 20s, 10s and 20s in Russia, they understood what was going on. They weren't that stupid. They understood this was Bolshevik atheist materialism, and yet they ended up compromising and denying why something else was wrong usually that's the problem when people apostatize the problem is not first and foremost the intellectual question that they're calling upon it's the spiritual rights they had given through the way of life and this is this is true in, in those who apostate to the heterodox confessions uh they're not in delusion and, and leaving the church because of some intellectual debate believe me because they had given rights to the enemy in their personal, spiritual, inner life. And then they were led into delusion on that. And then they justified their apostasy in that way. <coughs> Father, looking to the events of history and the rampart, rampant secularism and apostasy of all of us, we will likely be living through open persecution very soon. As men, especially, when does our responsibility to protect our families and parishes end? And our responsibility to lay down arms and die for the faith begin. Uh, as you see in the lives of the martyrs, the hierarchy of things and the, the calling is to not resist evil with force, right? That's the higher, that's the higher calling. Martyrdom is the great uh, feat, spiritual feat. That's what's praised throughout the history of the church. Uh, so resisting evil with force may be justified, may even be um, 
let's say, morally right, it's still lower on the totem pole. It's lower on the hierarchy of giving one's life for Christ and suffering. You'll see in the lives of the new martyrs that they there are examples of, for instance, there was a, a priest in, in prison, and he received a letter from his presbytera, his matushka, and she said, we're so happy, we're so grateful to God that you are made worthy to suffer for Christ. And we too are made now worthy, and it relates to the persecution that they were suffering. And so they rejoiced that they were able to suffer for Christ and with Christ. This is what we should all aim for, and not, uh, first and foremost, to resist evil with you know, any kind of uh, force in return. It's futile in the sense of, we know that the world is marching toward Antichrist. Uh, we will not change that path if those in power and those, the majority of the people in the world have chosen that and they refuse to repent. Well, the, they're free to do that. And even the Lord will not stop them, right? Our repentance, however, is what can contribute to, if not a reversal, at least a delay, and many of people avoiding that faith, avoiding that reality. So that's the hierarchy of things. We've got to focus more, and first and foremost, on that. But we have a responsibility to protect our families and parishes, but ultimately it's going to give way toward the crucifixion and imitating our Savior who, who voluntarily was crucified. Right? He was voluntarily crucified. <coughs> um, what about those Rocor catacomb groups who did not unite with the MP in 2007? How do you stand on these churches, the true Orthodox? We'll get, we'll get to that. We'll get to that when we get to that subject. That'll be in the uh, question of surgeonism and the catacombs the catacomb church so we'll, it's a little bit st stay tuned and we'll we'll deal with that when we get there uh where where can i find saint tikhon's anathema of the bolsheviks uh well i've seen excerpts of it i don't think it, i don't know if it exists in its entirety uh but in the catacomb saints uh the russian catacomb saints you have that um in the Orthodox Word, I think there's excerpts, but I don't know of any full text in English of the uh, of the letter. Um, but I'm happy. I'm happy if somebody knows that and can direct me. I'm happy to uh, to direct people to that. But I think if you have uh, our book, our textbook, you'll see uh, the excerpts from that in there. And then uh, I'm pretty sure that that uh, going through the Orthodox Word, for instance, uh, we, we'll find. Uh, even more extensive excerpts there. Is the modern day Silicon Valley intelligentsia akin to that during the Russian Revolution? If so, which is more damaging to the church, Chinese communism or American materialism to the church? <coughs> well, I mean, everything historically is different, right? So you can't, you can't make a total comparison between the two. But it is very interesting that the uh, intellectual elite of our day, the technocrats, um, I think that they have a utopian idea about the world. They're going to they're going to corral humanity into that uh, vision, and they're going to work toward bringing all of us into that uh, that utopian idea. And that's not much different than the Soviet intelligentsia as well, right? There was the whole as we as we learned in the Father Seraphim uh, Rose Survival Course lectures last fall, and you, if you're in our uh, Patreon uh, section, you can. Um, watch all of those lectures, and we may be putting some of those up online very soon as audio files. Just there's so much to do and there's so little uh, time. Uh, but uh, if you if you've read Father Seraphim Rose's survival course, uh, you will you will see uh, in there um, the. Uh, a fantastic analysis of the intellectual uh, roots of the revolution of the modern age of nihilism, and that is the utopian 17th, 18th, and 19th century uh, utopianists. And that's that's 
akin uh, and, and similar in East and West in communism and in contemporary America. That's what they have in common. They're both working toward it. And they're, and they're going to eventually use methods that even they perhaps 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago would not have thought that they would use. You'll see that they will be manipulated by the demons and they will be manipulated by the powers that be and they will step by step introduce methods that they themselves would not have thought that they would be allowing even a few years ago. This is the nature of the demonic is they incrementally works. Right? It doesn't come all at once. It incrementally works on people. So they eventually become more and more susceptible to demonic and evil ideas. And I think that's what, um, that's what unfortunately is where we're headed. Uh, I don't think Chinese communism uh, as such will be adopted in the West. Aspects of it already have been and will be. It'll be uh, it'll be applied in different ways. Um, you know, it's not it's not communism that's the problem. It's nihilism that's the problem. I mean, communism is a problem, right? Obviously, but behind co communism really is just a form of nihilism, and and um, nihilism is not an end in itself. It's it's a it's a it's a stage that will lead to the ascent of antichrist. So both American materialism and Chinese communism are are working toward that end. I think that. American materialism, in the gross, you know, sense, is is its days are numbered because you will see that. Uh, unfortunately, I think you're going to see more and more inflation and more and more in, in, in poverty coming to the uh, uh, West, uh, and so uh, and and they'll be forced uh, totalitarian uh, methods uh, in the West to control the society, control the economy, put down rebellion, and all the rest. This is what we may see in, in, in the near future. I, I'm not a prophet. I'm just telling you what I think may happen. Why do some Orthodox seem to sympathize with the communists? I don't know. Uh, what kind of Orthodox would sympathize with the communists? I mean, they're apostate Orthodox. You saw that. You see that in the in the uh, in the first ten years of the Church in Russia during the communists. That people, the especially the renovationists. So those who are renovationist spirited. Uh, as you will, we'll have a whole lecture on the renovation. It's very interesting. They tend to have such a stance, and of course, it's totally contrary to the gospel. The gospel does not um, see these things as, end, as ends in themselves. They do not see them as goods without Christ. It's impossible to talk about the gospel being carried out by communists when they reject the Lord Himself. It's just insanity. So they've obviously they've already become apostates and never knew Christ to begin with. Um, this is the this is the tragedy. There are renovationists today in the Orthodox Church as well. Another question: New to each Orthodox from Protestantism, outside of attending church, which I started a month ago, waiting to become a Catholic human. What are the what are your top recommendations on learning to grow in faith, hope, and love? What are your top recommendations on learning to grow in faith, hope, and love? <clears throat> well, I just posted something on orthodoxethos.com in response to a letter from a brother. I think that I will direct you to that. Uh, the question was, how do I increase the love of truth? And I give about four or five things there that I think that are really important. Um, it's an internal battle. Everything is internal. We've got to turn in on, on, on oneself and struggle against the inclinations, the movements of the soul toward sin, toward selfishness, toward egotism, all the things that are contrary to the presence of the Spirit of God. We have to, we have to uproot them, we have to be purified of them, and that happens through prayer and fasting. So this is an internal reality uh, that you, have to ha you will have in earnest when you are initiated. Before your initiation, you can make some progress in prayer and fasting, but really after your baptism, which is so important as a catechumen, you're beginning you become a catechumen. Okay, the catechumen is not a time of learning about Christ. Let me repeat that. The catechumen is not a time of learning about Christ. The catechumen is a time of being purified from the world and the ways of the world, and the habits of the world, and the mind of the world, so that you can put on Christ in baptism. You learn about him 
insofar as you need to throw off ideas that are contrary to the truth about him. That's it. That whole area of, of throwing off heretical ideas is a part of the purification process. It's a part of the purification process. What's really important is that one begin to purify themselves and that through prayer and fasting, they become, they become practitioners of the spiritual life even before baptism. It's important through prayer and fasting. Uh, but in, it, that's all in preparation for initiation. And then once one is initiated, then in earnest, you'll begin to see that the prayer, will prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, that mercy me, will begin to work deeply in the soul and the same spirit that will purify will be illuminating at the same time in the soul. And so I think that what you need to focus on is becoming a catechumen and focusing on the, the whole man being purified, his habits, his ideas, his uh, way of life, throwing off all of the sexual impurity of the day, throwing off all of the, uh, the way we think about our neighbor, ourselves. All this has to change. We have to acquire the mind of Christ. This is the process. That's why it took three years in the ancient church. Today, we've rushed. We need 10 years today. We do it in one. I mean, you know, if, if they needed three years in the ancient church, and the world was far more simple and traditional in many ways, although they were pagans were extreme. Today, we have so much more distortion on many more levels. And I think the process of purification is even more difficult. So I would say focus on becoming a good and struggling and prayerful and fasting, uh, struggling catechumen. And you'll see that the the growth in these virtues will come once purification has, has made progress and we're initiated into the life of the church. Just sent uh, another question. Uh, just sent the video names of Holy Week and the catechumens, guys. The question. I'm not sure what the question is. Just sent the video names of the Holy Week in the catechumens, guides in the quest for the Orthodox ethos, part one and two. Okay, is that? A, I guess that's not a question. It's just a comment. Father, can you tell can you tell about the old calendar as bishops ordained by Rokor? Uh, I can, but that's not really the time right now. And I'm not sure. The question is very general. What do you want to know about that? That's 1960s. We're talking about the 1920s and 30s. Let's 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 stay on topic, and then we'll understand the context and the future uh, in a future lecture. So stick with me. Uh, let's not jump around and say things in piecemeal. I don't like that at all. There's a tendency for people to learn little bits and pieces about very difficult and complex topics, and then we make a mess of it. So step by step, let's uh, let's let's make it uh, progress. All right. I think that's going to be it for tonight. We're two hours in. No more questions. Wait, let's see. Wait a minute. We do have one more question or two. We have actually quite a few, but we're going to be answering most of these on Thursday for our Crowdcrest um, brothers and sisters. Let me, uh, let me see if I can answer one or two from the folks there. The reactions of the martyrs in the lives of the saints may sound strange or even sick to a moderate ear. And difficult given our fear of death or even minor discomforts. For example, Saint Yulita was thankful that her three year old son, Saint Kyriakos, did not deny Christ and received martyrdom by being thrown down a flight of steps. This is the ancient martyr, uh, one of the ancient saints in the um, early church. The saints under communism also faced tortures and death. Is it right to worry that we may deny the faith if faced with the same situation? First question, is it right to worry? No, you should not worry. You should never worry because it's not you who are going to do it, but the Spirit of God dwelling in you. What we need to focus on is being in the Spirit of God and being in the prayer and fasting and increasing while we have time before the difficulties arrive. We have peace. We have time to go deeper and repent. This is what we should. We should be concerned about that and nothing else. We should not speculate about the future. We should not speculate. People, there were people like, Ivan Andreev, who were in the ca in the um, prisons in the Gulag, Solovki, but he ended up in the West. He didn't get. He was not never, um, you know, did not become a martyr. So if he had sat in the 30s and said, "Oh, how am I going to endure? How am I going to make it through the tortures?" 
I'm going to waste the time. So leave it to God. Leave it to God. Focus right now today. How am I going to go deeper and acquire the mind of Christ and acquire the way of the saints? The question goes on. Also, will we receive a special grace at the time of martyrdom? Or is it something that develops in the heart over time and you and you already have it hopefully when you need it? It's both. It's both. We have to, it's a It's a process of purification and illumination. It's a process of preparation. You don't get it, if you don't work in the cell, in the closet, you're not going to have it in the street. If you don't work in the peace, you're not going to have it during the war. You got It's both. But at, at the time that the temptation happens, our Lord clearly says in the gospel, do not prepare yourself, do not fret. I will give you uh, a, a mouth, and they will not be able to gainsay you. So it's both. It's both. God will help. But we have to struggle now to be made worthy of that assistance. All right, John, I think I answered your question. Let's go to a friend. A friend, in the book, Father Oseni, priest, prisoner, and spiritual father, Father Oseni says, Le leading up to the revolution, that there were only six monasteries that served as spiritual centers in all of Russia. All the others had succumbed to worldliness or secularism. This is scary to think about. Yes, I, I, don't, I wasn't familiar with that. I don't remember that. I read the book. Actually, I read the first the first volume. Is that the first volume you're referring to? Uh, years ago. Uh, you know, it's hard also. Father Asani saying that. I think it's a generalization. I think it's, unless he had some kind of divine enlightenment for that particular comment, but you know, there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of monasteries. So it's hard for me to believe that there was nobody struggling at all in all those monasteries. All right, certainly there were six light-bearing monasteries like Optina or Valam, who had the patristic tradition given through St. Paisi and, you know, had really amazing uh, spiritual fathers. That's no question about that. But I don't think we should become so... Uh, sure that there were not strugglers everywhere. I think there were because we have thousands of martyrs. How were, how did they end up being martyred and made worthy of martyrdom if they were not struggling in those monasteries? So, yes, many of those monasteries probably were not connected to the deep tradition, but uh, that doesn't mean that there were not strugglers. Are we going to see this in America, Ephraim asks? With only a few monasteries remaining spiritually strong and re resisting the evil that is coming, it's possible. There's no, friend. There's no guarantees. There's only love, and obedience, and that's what makes possible God protecting and intervening. Uh, so the rest of your comment, I'm not going to. I'm not going to. Relay because I think that's something we should talk about offline, probably. Right? There's a lot there. Uh, maybe we can talk about that on Thursday. Let's go to another question. In the Gospels and books of Acts, many people are instantly baptized upon conversion without lengthy catechesis. Infants and children are still baptized without full understanding. When did the church begin requiring lengthy periods of catechism prior to baptism? So, John, here's the thing the grace and the intensity of the grace. From Pentecost and in the early church with the apostles was in was unrepeatable and has been, I think, a you know special event in the church. And so the kind of things that we see happening there are, of course, you can imitate those things if the conditions are similar, but many, many times they're not, and we are weak and we are we are we need lengthy periods of catechism and that lengthy period began certainly in the fourth century we see that in the catechism of saint cyril in jerusalem that there's a three-year period a long period and it depends on the person coming it depends on the state of the world it depends on the state of the church the people catechizing there's a lot of there's a lot of factors and, and presuppositions that one has to take into consideration when the church considers one uh, ready for baptism. There are always exceptions. There are always exceptions. So uh, we don't want to become legalistic about it. There are always exceptions and people, be, uh, baptism is happening quickly for a variety of reasons. Only God uh, knows. But the key is for the pastor or the priest to be spiritually discerning and mindful and not making decisions on a worldly basis. Um, 
During perilous times, he writes, such as Russia's catacomb saints, and even perhaps today, wouldn't it be prudent to baptize anyone who wanted to join the Orthodox Church? Uh, maybe during the times of the Russian martyrdom, because you had immediate uh, threats to physical harm, I don't think we're that uh, at that point quite yet in the Western world. I don't see that, at least in my life, in my circles. And so I would not say that there is that it's prudent for one to be baptized just because they want to join the church. In fact, I've seen the opposite. I've seen that that kind of approach has been almost always destructive because people do not are not initiated in the life of Christ. And so the grace that they receive, they lose almost immediately. So it's not enough just to receive the grace. One has to keep it. And one has to be trained in how to keep it. So it's not enough. You've got to be careful. And I don't know, unless there's physical harm imminent, why would you rush a baptism? All right. That's John. Kiko. What were the main problems with the church that allowed the revolutionary hatred of Christianity to spread? Well, um, we've kind of talked about that a bit uh, in general terms. <coughs> the worldliness, <coughs> excuse me, the worldliness, lack of repentance, uh, the apostasy on the part of the intellectual and, 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 and elite. Um, I, I would say in a word, it's the same problem we have today. It's secularism, it's worldliness, it's uh, ritualism, it's the pastor's uh, not um, preaching repentance. I mean, it's, it's it's similar diseases throughout church history. It's not that uh, different. Although it was, if you listen to what St. John of, she of Cronstadt said in the, in, in the section that I was quoting from him, you'll see there uh, the, the maladies that he's talking about are the, are the, the faithfulness, faithlessness. In a word, it's apostasy, faithless, secularism, becoming part of the world, not living the ascetic life. These are the things that bring about uh, the abandonment of God's protection and the the ascent of uh, of the uh, atheists in every age. Father, do you see differences between the Russian and the Greek spirituality? How would you explain them pros and cons? All right, I think I'm going to call it here. We're at 2.14. It's about usually when I call it, two hours and 15 minutes. And we'll pick up that question from Maya uh, on Thursday, 9 p.m. Look forward to seeing you all then. Send in your questions. You can post them here, at, but mainly in the, um, in the question and answer section, uh, which will be set up uh, today. So for those who are, of you who are in the podcast, all the rest of us, all the rest of you who have been following us online, through social media, God bless you. See you next Tuesday. We'll pick up where we left off. We'll pick up uh, rather with, let me see, onslaught of persecution and resistance of St. Tikhon. Pretty much we'll pick up in the narrative that we left off and we'll go into uh, more of the historical and spiritual details about the persecution of the church and the resistance of the, of the faith. I hope this was beneficial. I hope that you'll uh, be inspired to follow us for the next 10 weeks and to be encouraged and inspired by the lives and the witness of the holy new martyrs. So with that, uh, not having any more questions, we'll go to the prayer and chant to the, the, the uh, Traparian to the Holy Cross, and we'll see you soon. God bless. Thank you. God help us to the prayers of the holy new martyrs. So, 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 in pleronomi an sudicastis basilepsi catar varvarum dorumenos ceton son filaton via tu stavrusu politema to the prayers of the Holy Father Jesus Christ our God have mercy on us and save us. Amen. God bless.